Hello and welcome to the Common Sense Gospel. I'm Danny Simmons. And I'm Kurt Norbert. And we are talking about the fact that your oil change is due. Uh, we're going to look at this idea of maintenance and the fact that the oil does need to be changed in our vehicles. Usually that's the main place that we see it. Uh, oil change due is literally the words that come up on a Dodge Charger as I, as I look that up. Um, the Dodge Charger says oil change due. Most vehicles will say engine oil at 0% or change oil soon. I don't know what yours says, but it may be saying something to you right now uh, that needs attention. That's why that's there, right, Kurt? Yeah, it's it's designed to inform you that there is some regular maintenance that needs to be done. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. Yes, you are going to be in trouble. I when I was probably 16 years old, I had uh, was riding along with my mom in, in the car. She had she had an older Cadillac, and this thing is thumping like it's making a thumping noise, mm-hmm. and so a couple of times while we're driving, she's like, oh, I wonder what that is. And that's, you know, I don't know. I'm No one's ever told me anything about that. So one of those days we're, we're riding along and smoke starts coming out from under the hood. And so she's, she's like, well, wow. I'm going to have to pull over <laughs> and see what's going on. So we open the hood and the smoke like billows out. And the guy, I'll never forget the the guy at the gas station says, have you changed your oil? And I, you know, I'm looking at my mom and the look on her face was like, what are you talking about? Oh, my she, you know, she always had a male presence, whether that's mm-hmm. right or wrong or fair or unfair. There was always somebody who just took care of it. And at this point in time, uh, she, there wasn't a male presence. I certainly wasn't the male presence she needed because I didn't know what the guy was talking about. But that's when I learned that if you don't change the oil, your car will catch on fire. Yeah. It, it'll, like it'll get that bad. You got serious problems. Yes. So there's a lot of things in life. Uh, we're using the vehicle as an example um, because we know that needs maintenance. Everybody knows a car needs gas. We all have the gas gauge, and we can see when it's dropping down. There's usually a yellow light that blinks. Bell starts to, to ding at us and tell us, you know, hey, you are about to run out of gas. Um, those things are absolutely necessary or your vehicle won't work. And what's interesting about that is you don't ever have to change your oil, and you don't ever have to fill your gas tank. You know that? You know, you can make the choice to say, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a valid choice. What you're going to run into, though, is are the consequences for that choice. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. So Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 18 says, because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. It's, it's just a fact. It's a principle of truth. Uh, if you're lazy and you're not taking care of those things that need attention around you, then they're going to fall apart. And that's the nature of everything, isn't it? Even us. Yeah, we we recognize clearly we live in a decaying world. Uh, things wear out, they break, machines will stop running, our bodies wear out, uh, they will not operate well if we don't take proper care of ourselves. Uh so we put a, a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of resources into maintaining our machines, maintaining our homes, maintaining our bodies. These things are important to us, and we can readily feel the impacts if we neglect the proper maintenance of these things. It, personal relationships also fall under the same umbrella. Those relationships need to be maintained or they will just cease to exist. And so in those things, we, we put effort. We, we recognize that. But as is normally the case when it comes to spiritual matters, what we readily recognize and deem as important in our physical lives tends to be neglected in our spiritual lives. Yeah, We, we can clearly see the importance in the physical realm but we just don't transfer that over to what it means to us spiritually. There's probably a lot of reasons for that too. It's that we there's nothing that demands our attention. Typically, we're just kind of drifting along, and we're dealing with things that are in front of us in life, and and that's that is that's where everyone is. We we have things we have to do. We have things that are pressing. We have some things that aren't that important, and so we we have to prioritize because we only have so much time each day, and. The spiritual is always the one, uh, you know, it seems to me that is neglected first because it's to me this it's especially in the in the early part of it, it's the less least obvious 
uh, of the of the thing that's not been getting the attention that it needs. I, I mean, I can you can really go quite a ways and quite a while without getting back into the Word of God and studying and, and saying, "Hey, this matters. This applies. I need to be serious." That that is, it it has to be discipline. You you know, we have hymns like "I Am Resolved." We we've got to decide this is important. I believe that God is telling me the truth about this. And so I'm going to, I'm going to live that way. Like it is the truth and it is important to me. Jesus says in Luke 13, someone, someone comes to Jesus in verse 23 and says to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? In verse 24, he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will, he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. So he's given us exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And striving doesn't mean just sit idly and, and hope it all works out. This is a conscientious effort, a determination on our part to say, the gate is narrow. I've been told that. And I need to know where it is and how to get through it because the other gate, which also exists, is broad. And, and why this plays out in line with what we're talking about is when do these people start trying to make their way through the gate, the narrow gate? It's when, when the door's shut. Hmm. When the, in, in the car example, it's when the engine catches on fire that we say, hey, I need help. And the person who watches you thinks, man, you needed help eight months ago and you've been driving around town like like you got – everything covered and and you absolutely don't you've ruined your vehicle that engine knocking and and the pistons cracking and whatever else happens inside that engine block uh that is so expensive to fix and so isn't that the case that even in the spiritual sense it's we see the same thing they come running up and saying lord open unto us and he says no the door is shut and it'll never be open it's the same thing with noah's ark you know who shut the door on the ark the lord did god did yeah and ain't nobody going to be able to open it because time was given. The long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. And when the time ended and he said, that's it, then he shut the door. And, and so that's the great tragedy of it all is that when someone sees the wreck and the damage they've caused by the neglect, spiritual neglect, then they're saying, well, I'll do anything. So yeah. for someone who wants to do it right, you've got to do anything now. Right. Yeah. It. It's it's better. the The term that's usually used is you have to use preventive maintenance. Exactly, and that draws the distinction of well, I'll wait till it breaks down. Well, now it's a little too late. You don't have it available now that when you need it because you allowed it to break down. And as you said, repairs or replacement is going to be a a huge drain on resources. It's better, and and we were taught this in the Navy because. No matter what your job is, it involves maintenance on the equipment that you use. And we usually had uh, a PMS to go by, a preventive maintenance schedule. Mm. And it would tell us, here are your daily checks. Here are your weekly checks. Here are your monthly checks. Here's a check. Here are the checks you need to do with your import because there are things we couldn't do when the ship was at sea. So it was all laid out for us. And, you know, you had to sign off on, yes, this was done uh, and that was done. Otherwise, you you faced some severe consequences. Uh, so you just couldn't afford to let your equipment run run along very nicely until finally it breaks down. Because then when you need it to protect the ship or to keep it moving or to defend, defend it from attack, now you can't do that. Yep. Uh, so I think, unfortunately, even though God has given us a preventive maintenance schedule in his word, and it's not laid out that, okay, now you need to do this every day, and this is what you can do once a week. <laughs> he does tell us these are important things for you to do. Why? Because they're preventive maintenance. They yeah. keep you from getting to a point where you are spiritually inoperative. That That's right. You don't. It just don't work anymore. And when you need it, it's not there to, to take advantage of it. It's not there for you. And and unfortunately, like you were using the example of your little yellow light will blink at you or you'll hear a, 
dinging bell or something in your car, we don't we don't have flashing lights or alarms that tell us Bible reading due, uh, prayer time <laughs> imminent. You know your your weekly services are coming up. Go to go to go to the assembly. <laughs> Those are things that we have to develop the habit of. That's right. Uh, and if we miss it, then internally the alarm goes off. Ooh, I missed my regular Bible me- reading. I if, missed my time feels for bad. prayer. Yeah, and that should be an alert for you. And if if you don't have that alarm system, it means that you're not doing it in the first place. You've yeah. not developed that alarm. You haven't been engaging in the preventive maintenance. And so now you're beginning to slip. That's right. I like the naval ship example a lot because, as you said, there's a larger purpose involved that everyone knows and understands on that ship, that if we are called to go to battle, everything has to be running perfectly. We want to succeed, and we do not want to die out here on this water. So there's a there's a huge overarching purpose that everyone does their part and it is a well-oiled machine and it is ready to go when we need it. But it, even in that example, if you have this list of chores basically that you have to do each day and you check it every day and it's always fine, you know, the tendency is I, I checked it, you know, I'll, I'll do it once a week because I'm, I don't want to go down there every day. And so you change what you were required to do. And as you said, your, your signature is not there. Your name's not there. You have not been looking at that. You're accountable and you know it and you know that you failed and you could cost the life of the lives of all those around you. You depend on each other. So it ties in very well with the spiritual realm as well. Like you said, going to the assemblies, having Bible studies, meeting with people that you know, love God and spending time with them because as iron sharpens iron, so is a man with the company that he keeps and, and there's a lot of biblical examples who deal with the, not the na- naval battleship, but the boat. Uh, we have an anchor that hmm. keeps the, stole, the soul steadfast That's and right. sure. Um, we're, we're told that lest we drift, you know, that the, mm-hmm. and we're talked about the, the, the waves of every doctrine, the wind and waves of, of doctrine that will knock us off of where, where we're supposed to be. The trickery of men. Um, our own carnal desires. There's so many things that pull us away from that which is spiritual and heavenly. And so if you're not determined, you're not going to do well. No, it takes, just like our our schedule in the Navy, whoever designed and built that particular system also designed and built the maintenance schedule for it. They knew what that equipment needed they knew when it needed it. They knew what kind of maintenance it would need. And so if those things weren't done, then that, that instrument, that, that machine, whatever it might be, is not going to perform as it was designed to perform. So, uh, you know, if we, and if we did like you were mentioning, oh, this is a, an easy check and every, it checks out every time. I'm a, it's a hassle. I'm going to do it once a week. Well, eventually some officer or superior to you is going to come in and check the maintenance schedule. (laughs) Norbert, why haven't you signed off on this list? Well, you know, sir, I I check it every week. It says daily, Norbert. (laughs) Why aren't you checking it daily? And now now I have to have some answers. Yeah. I'm, I'm in trouble. Okay. So, but it's recognized. They understand that if everyone takes that attitude, then the machinery is going to break down and that ship becomes useless and dangerous. In fact, it's not going to perform its job and it might, something might happen where now it's a hazard to remain on the ship. Something has gone wrong that has endangered the crew simply because someone said, well, I'm, I'm going to do it this way. It's not, not that big a deal. Well, it was designed into the system for a reason. And we don't necessarily need to know what the reason was. We just had to make sure that the equipment worked That's right. the way it was supposed to work. So same thing spiritually. If, if we, uh, you know, I don't have to pray every day. I just, and I just pray the same thing. So, you know, every week that'll be enough. Wow. Well, <laughs> no. The Bible tells us we need it. 
pray without ceasing, which doesn't mean you never, ever stop praying, but it shows that there's a consistent pattern of prayer in your life. Exactly. And we see that in, in godly saints that are recorded for us throughout the scriptures. I always think about Daniel. Uh, no matter what he was doing, and he was a busy and responsible man, being one of the major counselors in the kingdom, he made sure three times a day he went up and, and knelt in his window towards Jerusalem and prayed to God. In fact, he was so regular in that that his enemies used it against him because they right. knew he would be doing that. Yep. So that's the kind of preventive maintenance schedule that Daniel was following. He knew he needed that. He knew the people needed it. He knew it was pleasing to God. He knew he needed that help living in a pagan land with, with all of his responsibilities. It was important for him to engage in that daily maintenance, and he made sure that he didn't. And he didn't let anything deter him. When he found out his enemies were going to use that uh, regular prayer time against him, <laughs> he went ahead and did it anyway. That's right. Trusting that the Lord was going to take care of him. Which he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so there, there's your maintenance right there. Daniel is such a good example. Uh, Gabriel comes to Daniel in chapter 9 and chapter 10, I believe, three times. And he says, oh, Daniel, greatly beloved. Yeah. Man, and it's like, why am I greatly beloved? Because you honor and love God, and He loves you back. You know that you you are doing the things that all Israelites should be doing, and, and you do it faithfully, no no matter what the circumstances are. So maintenance is important. Obviously, we have the house um, maintaining our home. Um, I, I think most of us fall into the category of my my home. And I'll, I think I'm in there too. My home's well maintained. You know, my wife and I do all that we can. Well, I, I said that wrong. We do what we should, I guess, <laughs> to uh, to maintain. You know, what what's needed? Air filters, yeah, uh, water heater. Th those things need attention. And and again, if if you don't do it, then you're going to be making a phone call and spending a lot of money. But I think the category that I'm that I'm mindful of is that when uh, we have friends over all of a sudden home maintenance becomes a little more important. You yeah. know, um, we either make our boys clean their rooms or we shut and lock their doors so no one can look in there. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, we've got a guest bathroom. And so that guest that has to be cleaned from top to bottom. And we try to make it look like no one actually even lives there. You know, it's like a model home or something <laughs> because we don't want people to think that we have fallen short on a maintenance mm -hmm. that, that should be done. It says something about you. When, when you drive by someone's yard, you can tell a lot by a person's yard. Proverbs 24 and verse 30 says, I went past the field of a slacker and by the vineyard of a man lacking judgment. And he says it was all overgrown. Yeah. The things that needed mess. attention were mm -hmm. falling over. Everything was a mess. There, what, what should have been growing wasn't and what shouldn't have been growing was. Hmm. So how, how, can, how can you walk by someone's house and go, hey, I just passed the house of a slacker? How could you know that? Well... It doesn't take much to see it. If someone is really careless, that lawn badly needs a mowing. Yes. Uh, the paint's chipping off the side of the house. Cracked window. You know, the, the, there are shingles missing off the roof. You know, it's, there are signs that you can see where the maintenance is not being done. That's right. And it's the same thing spiritually, which the Bible tells us. Encourage each other, be watchful for each other, care for each other. And so when you see signs of a lack of maintenance and they're going to be there, then they, they need attention. And just think, you know, you, uh, this popped into my head as you were talking about your guest bathroom. <laughs> if you keep it clean all the time, you just, you, you know, run in there a little bit every day, make sure it's dusted or whatever. No problem. But after a couple months, we're going to have people coming over, spending in the night. We need to clean that guest bathroom. Well, we haven't done much about it these last couple of months. Now it's a big job that has to get done. Some of that stuff so, won't come off either. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot easier to do a little regular stuff now than have to wait and then have to do a huge expensive job later. Yep. Just, just take care of what needs to be done today. and. What's more important than your soul? You're, you need regular prayer. You need regular Bible reading. You need uh, regular fellowship with the saints. All of those things 
our designer has put in place to maintain the spiritual machine, if you if you will. That's right. Uh, he has designed us. He knows what we need, so he's given us those things that will maintain us, that'll keep us functioning the right way. If we do those things, we're in good shape. If we're neglected, uh, they are neglected. We become neglectful. They're just we don't care. Then there are going to be consequences for that. Just like when you neglect something physically, the machine breaks down. Now you have a problem. It, it, the spiritual application is is right alongside that. Yeah, and, it, and the more we go through this and talk about it, the more um, different examples I'm thinking of with just the, in the home, there's all these subsets of responsibilities like the children themselves. Uh, the Proverbs tell us that a child left unto himself will bring shame to his mother. You can't just let a kid raise himself. Uh, they need guidance. They need instruction. And that that is a maintenance. Like you said, it's preventative maintenance. It it still works. It applies. And, and it, if we're good at it, if we're diligent to do those things, then the result will show itself. Uh, and it's, it just works out in everything in life. And I t- tell my boys a, a lot when they were younger that when you go out, when you spend the night at so-and-so's house, um, remember that you you are a Simmons. You, you, you hold the Simmons name. You're a reflection of your parents. We typically don't think of things that way, but when you when you speak, when you act a certain way, that you are telling the world who your parents are, and what we stand for, and and it's very important that uh, you hold yourself to the highest standard to honor your own family. You know, it's it's not like don't let please don't let your friends' parents know that we're no good. It, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that. What we've done with you and the training that we've given to you through the years will be revealed in the way you act when we're not there. And it's just a fact. And so I think that's preventative maintenance too. Yep. And people will be able to see if you haven't done your maintenance. When your kids go over there and act up and get themselves to a point where they're unwelcome, that's going to reflect on the parents. They haven't done their maintenance. Yeah. Um, so... It shows to everybody, just like when you drive past the old downtrodden house where the people just don't care what it looks like, that tells you a lot about the inhabitants. But it's, it's not even really the, the physical house. You know, you just touched on part of it. What is the home, really? It's the parents. It's the kids. It's the tone that's set. It's how that marriage is doing. Yeah. That requires maintenance, and it requires daily maintenance. Uh, and it doesn't matter how long you've been in that marital relationship. You could be married 50 years and, and then you get to thinking, well, she know the old joke. I don't have to tell her she lo- I love her because she knows it by now. Well, it's nice to know that it's still there. Oh, man. And so it needs to be said. That's right. And so that there is maintenance, a lot of maintenance, a lot of work that goes into a good, stable, well-established God honoring marriage. Absolutely. Yeah, that's Psalm 127 in verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. So we've got the Lord who builds the house, who's told us to, to maintenance these things um, for the husband to love his wife and to be willing to die for her, and for the, hus- for the wife to respect her husband, that those things are appropriately done because they honor God with their lives. That's, that's who they've determined to be, and it takes effort. Because the other part, the, the spouse, is not always in line you know, with all the Bible teaches. And, and you're still called to be what God's required you to be. When those things are kept the way they should be, then you do have a, a fruitful and a beautiful marriage that, uh, that's an example to the, to the people around you. And the, the opposite is true. Because Psalm 127 says, if, if you build the house without the Lord, you labor in vain. So the people who say, well, we don't really want to do it the Lord's way. We've got this new plan that we came up with or a new book we read. Then you're still building a house. Mm-hmm. But the passage is clear. You've decided to do it without the Lord and you are doing it in vain. You are wasting your time and, and it's going to fall apart. There's going to be something come up that you have no idea how to handle because it's not established on eternal truth. It was on what you thought or how you felt. And that never plays out well long term. Yeah, right along with the theme we've been talking about, God has designed these various things. He designed the marital relationship. He told us what it's supposed to be, and he tells us how to maintain it. When that maintenance is not done, 
then what was designed is going to fail to operate. That's just a fact of creation. We yeah. see it in the physical world. It's true in the spiritual world. That marriage will come apart. It'll die because it hasn't been nourished. It hasn't been maintained. And it takes that constant nourishment. Uh, you, don't, you don't walk out to your garden uh, having maintained it and then decide, well, I've, I've done all this stuff all growing season for my garden. So uh, it, it can go into cruise control. It'll get it, you know, it'll grow fruit in there. It'll get done. And so I'm not going to worry about it. You don't do that to your garden expecting fruit. You're going to walk out there in a couple of weeks and all of a sudden what you planted is disappearing. As you said, what's supposed to be growing ain't growing so much anymore. And the stuff you didn't want is all over the place. Same in a marriage, same in any relationship. Yeah. You don't maintain it. It's going to start coming apart. Yeah, it's so true. And so with all the earthly examples we have, this is directed and intended to point us back to the spiritual needs that each and every one of us have, that they should not be neglected, that we can do preventative maintenance so that we don't fall into those um, age old traps that so many, you know, we, we have examples too of people who have tried to do things other ways and we see how that plays out. The evidence is stacked so high to prove that, God's way is right. And, and we can look at those who have kept it. We can look at those who have refused it and, and see where those two individuals were led to or how that ended up for them. Um, and I think, you know, there's always these, um, I guess, questionnaires. There's always, mm. they're always trying to find out, you know, who's the happiest people in America. Different who, surveys and who's, stuff. Yeah, yeah, who has the most joy? And so I, I just saw one a couple of days ago that, you know, married couples were at the top and, they had it all categorized and they tried to explain why, but those are, most of those are, um, superficial or just surface level. Like, Hey, I'm happy. You know, I really am happy. And, and joy doesn't come from the emotional moment by moment. I just want to be happy. True joy comes from God and true joy comes from knowing that God loves you and, and, and he's done all that has to be done for you to be saved. And, and, and eternity waits for us. You know that we're joyful because we have a hope that we have the greatest confidence in the world in. And so that's where joy is settled and determined. And then the happy stuff can come and go as, as it will for anybody. But if the Lord's not building the house, we're laboring in vain. And, and that, man, there's some deep spiritual truths to that. And even again, you, you mentioned our hope which is what motivates us. Uh, it's the hope that is set before us that we will be with our Lord eventually. Uh, this life will decay, decay. It will come to an end as all things do in this, in this physical realm. But if we've done the maintenance, we'll be ready for that transition. Uh, but if we don't engage in regular Bible reading, regular prayer, regular worship, that hope is going to fade. That hope needs to be maintained and fed. Uh, it's something that God has placed within us. He's, he's shown us to us. He's given us a reason for the hope that is within us. But we have to remind ourselves of that hope and why it's important and what it's based on. Otherwise, we'll eventually just not appreciate it, and it'll dim and become inoperative. It just it won't be there for us. That's right. It's always true. And so, the, again, the spiritual, we're talking about the spiritual side of things and why this is so important for us. Because just like with every example we've given, we don't want to find ourselves in a moment where it, we say, oh, no, what have I done? Because if you don't tend to these things, that is coming. There. We, we we noticed in the example that Jesus gave that, that they'll, they will come and knock on the door after the door is shut. And we don't decide when the door gets shut. We can't, we can't negotiate the timeline or the appointment that has already been determined in which we have to answer to God. I think it's Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And so if, if, if that's how this ends for us, we can't let that happen. It, the regret, the anguish, and the pain that would follow without any way to repair or fix the damage we've done, 
is too high of a price to pay, especially when we've been forewarned over and over and over again. Um, in Proverbs 1, just think about give, being given wisdom and knowing, okay, now I know what I should do, and then deciding, eh, don't want to do that. Wisdom is crying out in Proverbs 1. In, in, in verse 24, it says, Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention, and you neglected all of my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satisfied with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. I've, I've read that throughout my life and I've always thought, you know, why would wisdom scoff? Because we know God, he doesn't, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But I think it's not that, it's not that wisdom is standing over you going, ah, loser. You know, it's not that the wisdom because of the, its position and the recollection of what wisdom had shared with you when you chose not to do it, that is the scoff and the scorn. And, and you're the joke. The joke's on you. Yeah. You were told what you were supposed to do, and you said, no, thank you. I'm going to do it my way. And there is this awful moment where wisdom says, I will mock you in your anguish. It's simply because it is still wisdom and it's still true. And now it's been directly applied to me. So in that sense, the wisdom scorns and, and scoffs at us. Yeah, and. It- in in line of, of the theme that we're looking at, that was your maintenance. Wisdom was telling you what needed to be done. And that person just says, uh, no, my way's better. And then when it's shown that it's not, it's usually too late. The engine blew up because you weren't changing the oil. Right. And now that that engine sitting there smoking when you've lifted the hood is mocking you. It's not that wisdom has become evil-hearted, so to speak, and I'm just going to make fun of you. It's This is the consequence of you not hearing, of you not listening, of you not taking responsibility. It's going to come back at you. And then when you're going, I, what do I do? What do I do? Like you said, I've been told what to do. Wisdom now mocks me in the sense that you were given everything you need to know, and now you're coming for help? It's too late. There's nothing more that could be done because I told you everything. You chose not to engage in the maintenance schedule. That's right. It is just as simple as that, and it is vitally important for every one of us. Uh, Kurt and I, certainly included, put us on the top of the list. Mm. We have got to be on top of these things. We have to understand how yeah. important and valuable they are to us. And that there's a greater, there's something greater coming, and we're we're preparing ourselves, we're pressing on towards that high calling of Christ because we know the reward that awaits those who diligently strive to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, we'll finish with a couple of other things, but I had a couple of questions for you that I want to drop on you. Are you ready for those? Well, I guess I'll have to be. I I've, I've been trying to do my maintenance. We're gonna find uh, out. I've been you know reading the Bible, so hopefully I'll. I'll have the answers. Our check engine light is not on. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm willing to guess that we're, we're going to be okay. Oh, trivia. Oh, trivia. Trivia. Sweet trivia. So Kurt and I have four questions for all of you. My first question that Kurt will try to answer <laughs> is this. As Joshua and the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan River... What was the first city that they destroyed? Jericho. Yes. <laughs> I realized when I asked it, that could be a trick question because they didn't destroy the city. They did burn it with fire, but God knocked those walls God down. God knocked flat. the down to, so they could get in and take the city. Right. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell flat yeah. because God, they did what God told them to do, right? It's exactly yeah, what is. we're talking about. 
they follow, even though it didn't make any sense militarily, yeah. it's like, wait, you want us to do what? Walk around and yeah. quietly for six days and then what? You know, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. No, no commander would go into battle with that battle plan. And yet yeah. it was God's plan and it worked. Purely an exercise of faith. Awesome. Because there's no way that, what is this going to do to enable us to take this city? All we're doing is making a rut in the ground because <laughs> we, we walk in a circle around the city. Once a time, once a day for six days. What is going on here? And the people in Jericho have kind of be going, going. What are they say doing? What? <laughs> this is the people of God. Yeah. So that's Joshua chapter six, verses one and two. God says, "I have given Jericho into your hand." Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Here's here's mine. In Acts twenty seven and twenty eight, we read about Paul's shipwreck on Malta. Um, after that shipwreck, what unusual event happened to Paul? that caused the survivors to first think that he had to be a criminal, but then they later changed their mind and said he must be a god. <laughs> um, it was his uh, yoga practices that they were so amazed with. No, that's not right. Uh, yeah, that comes much later. Okay. Then I'm going to go with he's gathering sticks for, for fire, for, for the wood for the fire, and he is bitten by a viper. Yes. And he says mm -hmm. he just shakes that thing off into the fire. And so they, they, the people say, oh, the gods have judged him. He's, he's, a, he's an evil man. But then nothing happens. They're watching him. He never gets sick, never dies. His hand doesn't swell up. And they say he must be a god. Yep, that's right. Acts 28, verses 3 through 6. You recounted it perfectly. That's a gold star, Danny. Yes. All right. I'm all about the gold stars. Yes. We hope that you are doing well. Also, here comes your third question. When Peter, this is going to be in Acts again, Acts chapter 12. When Peter escapes from prison in Acts 12, he goes to the house of John Mark's mother. As he knocked on the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, what did she do next? She ran in to tell everybody that Peter's at the gate. <laughs> and they didn't believe her. And he's out there pounding them <laughs> on the gate. <laughs> Would just, you let me in? Yeah, he, he's an escaped prisoner. He's like, I, I need some cover here. <laughs> he's outside banging on the door. The, the, the passage says, when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but yeah. ran and announced that Peter stood before the <laughs> gate. And you're right. The, the people in the house said, it must be a spirit. Yeah. It's like, really? That's you're going, is that what you're going with? They were in the house praying that Peter would be freed. Yeah. He shows up at the door. And then they're like, no. And then when they opened the door, they're astonished that it's Peter. <laughs> He's like, thank you for the prayers, brethren. I yeah, appreciate it. It 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 reveals something about our our the attitude we should have toward prayer. Absolutely. But that's another podcast. Yes. Uh, here's uh, here's my second one for you, and the the fourth one for our our audience. When Jesus revealed himself to Saul, later Paul, in Acts chapter nine, where was he going? And why was he going? As he's going on the road there in Acts 9 and meets Man. Jesus, where was he heading? And why was he heading there? He's on the I, road to... I, I, I want to say Damascus. Are you sure you want to say that? Yes. He wants to say it, ladies and gentlemen. He <laughs> is correct. Ding, 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 ding. I had all these different town names like flowing through my mind. He's Saul of Tarsus. Yeah. Yeah. And I was trying to remember where he came out of. He, he came he from the chief priest. He was coming from Jerusalem. Yeah. Jerusalem. Okay. Yeah. Yep. He, he was, was heading for Tarsus. Damascus. And the second part of the question, why? Oh, to, to round up Christians. And yep. He, he, had, he had a signed document, I believe. He had the paperwork yep. he needed to. He had authority from the priest to to apprehend Christians, whether male or female, and bring them bound back to Jerusalem. Yep, so he was on his way to persecute the church. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Awesome. Well, as always, we... we oh, I shouldn't say we, we've done well. As always, we hope you have done well. Yes. Because we do want you to do well on those questions. These are just uh, things pulled out of the Bible by us. We want to see how, how the other one responds and if they know the answer, and certainly for all of you. But uh, it's not to be a discouragement. It's just an, an encouragement, really, to say, I need to know more about that and to go look into it and read it. And that's why we provide those Bible verses for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the need to maintain your vehicle is the evidence of an important principle of truth. 
And I would liken, as we've talked about it today, I would liken this truth to the immutable laws of God. There are some things that no matter how hard we try or how much we want to change, they can't be changed. They are the immutable laws of God. The sad and painful reality of someone who will not acknowledge the immutable laws of God is that basically they never change their oil and then they don't understand um, how to keep up with basic vehicle maintenance because either no one's told them or they just don't care that they will inevitably think that their car breaking down was bad luck. There's mm-hmm. going to be awful timing when it happens. They're going to be just as fate would have it. They're going to be on the wrong side of town. They just needed to do one more, fi- one more thing before the weekend began and they could go enjoy the, the weekend as they plan to do that. And, and so they say, why me? You know, poor me. This always happens to me. Well, ask yourself an important question. Why does this always happen to you? When you take that smoking vehicle into the mechanic and he says, why didn't you do this? That's when the application is made, the truth is revealed, and we can say, okay, now I know, and so I am determined to do this right. I want to preserve and protect the things I care about. And each one of us has to want to care and protect the thing we should care most about, which is our precious soul which Christ died for. Your maintenance is important and it must be done. Psalm 10, beginning in verse 3, says, The wicked boast of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His, God's ways are always prospering. God's judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. It's the great, awful failure that is given to us in Psalm 10. I personally shall never be moved. And the reason I know that is because I said so. Hmm. And God in wisdom looks down and laughs because God is not mocked. What a man sows that he shall also reap. 